We've been talking quite a lot about China this morning, not only about uh, the treatment of the Ouija people up in the north of the country, but also uh, confirmation that Dominic Raab will be addressing members of parliament later today and that the extradition treaty uh, with uh, uh, China uh, is to be suspended over uh, Hong Kong. There's also the whole backstory of what's going on with Huawei and that company being barred from G5, but also now buying into smaller companies. Uh, it's a deeply troubling concern. Therefore, I am delighted that my next guest is uh, Tobias Elwood, who is the chair of the Defence Select Committee uh, and, as it happens, Conservative Member of Parliament for Bournemouth East, which is where I know him from, first of all. Uh, Tobias Elwood, very good morning to you, sir. Good morning to you. I'm going to... Funny thing going to say this before I start asking that select committees were established years ago really to keep an eye on big government to make sure in the Thatcher days when the majorities were so huge they didn't sort of go off and do their own thing and ignore people and you still have that right uh, to call ministers in and bring them to task but would I be right in suspecting that you give a hearty round of applause to what Dominic Raab said yesterday and what he's reported to be about to say this afternoon? Yes, absolutely. We're seeing the uh, conduct of China over this pandemic, uh, trying to suppress the news of the outbreak, uh, what they're doing in Hong Kong. I think people are, are revisiting their views of what they believe China is about. And that's absolutely right. For, for years, there's been this conventional wisdom that it's only a matter of time before China would open up its doors, become more liberal as it involved itself with the world's economy. And the Communist Party was that in name only. Clearly, that isn't the case. I think we've been, in fact, duped over the last few years. China is on a very different trajectory. And what we're seeing today in the last few days with Huawei, as you mentioned, is finally a country, Britain, standing up to uh, mm. uh, to what China is uh, is offering and saying this is not acceptable in today's day and, uh, today's day and age. They want to be a superpower, but without any of the responsibilities that uh, that come with that. OK, uh, but the same point to you as I did to Ian Duncan Smith, who is, you will know better than I, as the founder and co-chair of the uh, Interparty uh, Committee on Hong Kong. Bluntly, Oliver, uh, uh, Tobias, um, can we afford to take the moral high ground with China coming out of the pandemic facing huge economic consequences to say, oh, no, because of a point of principle, we're now going to get tough with China on trade. Well, it isn't just a point of principle. As I say, this has been long coming of us having meeting a turning point and saying we can no longer uh, accept what China is actually doing. I understand they that. But I mean, coronavirus makes our timing impeccably bad, does it not? OK, but do we continue going down this road where China gets bigger, more mightier economically, militarily and technologically as well? We are heading towards a bipolar world with China actually redrafting the international world order or even making that world order uh, paralyzed. For example, in the United Nations Security Council or indeed in the World Health Organizations, the G20 has no power at all. So we need to work with our allies, such as the United States, and say we need to absolutely welcome China to the international top table but under global terms, under those standards and values, which I'm afraid the West has forgotten what they're about and willing to defend. And so this, what we're seeing today, are important chess moves. But my question to Dominic Raab with, it will be exactly what you're pointing to. How does this fit into a bigger yeah. geopolitical strategy change? We need to reset our views on China. And that means absolutely uh, upgrading, for example, our defense posture, who we trade with and so on. Some very difficult, big questions that we now face. But also micro questions as well, though, because it, interestingly, as you you said about China, you know, there was all of the promise of the, um, I think it was uh, Deng Xiaoping era in the late 70s when they were embracing markets and experimenting with uh, sort of fairly liberal trade policies. But now it's, it's turned full circle. We get tough on Huawei. And the first thing that Huawei does is then buy a 20 percent stake in quite an important British telecom company. So <laughs> they've learnt the rules of engagement and you might have to get even tougher with them if you want to keep Huawei out of our telephony. Well, this is, again, my point. You just can't have a single policy on Huawei. You have to have a full policy on China. 
which means that whether it be nuclear power stations or TikTok or whatever, you have an absolutely robust approach which will work. Would you stop the power that... station now? I'm sorry? Would you stop work on the power station deal now? You know, you sort of make my point for me. You can't do these in individual selections. We can't take one point at a time and make a judgment over it. We need a wider strategy. What you're talking about is individual tactical uh, questions and solutions. I'm saying step back and say, where do we want to go with China? They will overtake the United States as being the world's dominant power. Uh, but their Achilles heel compared with the last Cold War that we went into is the fact that they require international trade. And when you put America and Europe's trade together, we actually are far larger than China. But we've actually lent over on China's terms. Many of these big companies that we talk about, telecoms companies in the UK, aren't allowed to trade in China. Mm. When you talk about Twitter and Facebook and uh, um, Amazon, eBay, they're not allowed to trade in tri China. And yet those companies, their equivalent companies, are allowed to trade in the West. So we need to be far more robust. We've rolled over too far in appeasing China, hoping that they would mature into this global responsible citizen. It hasn't happened. What they're doing on the Indian border now, what they're doing in Hong Kong, what they're doing in the South China Sea, what they're doing right across with their debt trap diplomacy of hundreds of, of tens of, com of, of countries becoming so indebted to China, they won't even stand up and criticize China anymore. And our, as I say, our international global order, the G20, the United Nations, uh, even the EU, they are not strong enough to stand up to China because we're too scared we're for fear of losing some trade with, with China. Well, and those last words are the very, very point that I was making in my initial question to you. I didn't interrupt because that was a very important analytical answer and, and, and set the strategy to it. But I'm going to risk coming back to you on the tactical question again. I hear what you say, and I hear what you say particularly about the World Trade Organization, G20, our great global allies and so on, as we try and reset that relationship with China. That's strategic. But tactically, does that mean you stop any further development on the nuclear power project that is going on right now with Chinese money, Chinese technology and even Chinese designs. Well, look at what's happened with 5G. We decided on Huawei, we don't want them. And immediately we hear there's noises about China pulling out of supporting our universities or pulling out or threatening uh, British banks in Hong Kong. So I think it's, it vindicates our decision to do that. And that begs the question about the nuclear power uh, investments or indeed in uh, any building that they might do, how might they utilize that in the future? to leverage economic power over us if we've become subservient to their technology or indeed their investments. And that's the big challenge that we must face. This is a strategic question uh, that we need to pose ourselves. We're at a turning point here. And I hope that uh, given the, the, uh, the events, the, they're not just seen as a diplomatic spat, but an absolute opportunity to recheck, to reset our foreign policy with a country which is, I'm afraid, currently on a trajectory to a bipolar world and another Cold War. The other side of that coin, and you mentioned it yourself, um, Tobias, is with, I quote, our allies, our great partners. We are uncoupling from Europe. Brexit's done as a point of principle, and now it's down to the detail and the negotiation and whatever trade deal follows that. And we're coupled very, very clearly with the United States of America, who may or may not change their uh, president uh, come November. Uh, again, I have to put it to you, time is not on our side. If, if, you, if you have to do it, now is not necessarily the most auspicious time uh, for doing it. If you're someone worried about their job, worried about paying their debts, worried about even the company that they work for. Well, it's important that we do end up with a strong relationship with Europe for the very reasons that we've said. Yeah. It's actually in China's interest to see Europe's, Europeans split they want to sow division between us, and they can. Uh, they will succeed in doing that. Uh, the more countries, the more companies um, are signed up to the Chinese way of life. It's important that the international community stays together, and we're far away from that. But you look across the world now, more countries are becoming siloed, becoming uh, retreating from global exposure, often because of COVID-19 as well. 
But there's little international leadership. We're not seeing it from the United States, if we're very honest. Their America First program mm. has seen them retreat from any uh, international leadership. And this plays into China's hands itself. So I do hope that uh, you've got Secretary of State Pompeo visiting, visiting today, that we recognize that we are stronger together. Just after the Second World War, we created what are called the Bretton Woods organizations, but they are now woefully out of date and we need to include China. They were excluded at that point. Most people don't actually understand China's very, very proud history. You know, the Boxer Rebellion, the Opium Wars and so forth, their own history itself. If we better understand China, we're more likely to be able to work with China and the Chinese people uh, and stand up to the communist regime, which I believe is out of sync with yes. its own people. And that will avoid a, 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 the uh, forthcoming Cold War. Fascinating. Final point then, and I, I ask you to, to to be as expansively reflective as you have been up to now, Tobias, if you will. I mentioned Deng Xiaoping. I mean, either one has studied it in those lovely books behind you, or if you're my age, you remember some of it. But the, the, the journey from Mao Zedong and the Great Revolution in China, tough communism, cultural revolution. Deng Xiaoping did happen. There was 78, 79. There was liberalisation. And then Tiananmen Square and what have you. Uh, and we're now definitely old school, hardline communism, what have you. Is what you're really getting at that this is an opportunity not only for us to reset our relationship with China, but God forbid China might even look upon itself and reflect inwards as well and think, do you know what? It was slightly better in the 80s than it is now. You know, you're the first journalist that's even bothered to ask those very important questions as to what's going on internally in China, which is quite fascinating. When you see the reaction when a senior Chinese leader went to Wuhan, the outbreak of this pandemic, uh, he was booed by uh, many of the residents leaning out of their, their apartments in their high rises, booing the communist state leaders. And that shows that there is a middle class there very upset with what's going on. They don't like being li living on, in a suppressed, fearful atmosphere. And that there is a, an uprising, I see, bubbling within China itself. Very, very interesting to watch it, itself. Mm. And, and, and to underline China. to everybody listening, because you know it, you're a former military man as well. That takes real guts to do that in China. It's very different to joining a protest in Paris or in London. Oh, completely. Absolutely right. It, for something to trigger that sort of outbreak, there really has to be general, uh, absolutely genuine anger. And no doubt people are fearful of the trouble that they'll get into. It is such a surveillance society there in China. And again, us calling out what is going on with the Uyghur population. Millions of people who are Muslims, but are actually segregated in the rest of the population, made to have abortions and so forth, mm. really affecting that, um, that entire ethnic uh, minority there. So the fact that Britain is calling that out as well, like I said, this is lots going on here. I hope this isn't just down to down as a diplomatic spat and we all move on, but a real turning point in our sort of geopolitical approach to China. But I stress, we can only do this if collectively the West works together. Tobias Elwood, a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you very much for finding time for us this morning. Thank you.